very first live webinar. <laughs> My name is Jenny and I am here tonight to grill George on all the things about Vivian Meyer. Um, just so everyone knows, we're going to have a Q&A section at the end. Uh, I do have a few questions from people already, but if anyone wants to send questions via the Q&A <coughs> chat, feel free to do so and we will collect those questions at the end and pose them to George. Um, I wanted to do a quick note that this is normally free first Thursday night at Glenbow when we welcome thousands of people into the museum in the evening um, for free. So this is coincidentally a very nice way to kind of honorarily mark that and give a shout out to Service Credit Union who are an amazing partner in helping support that program. And we very much look forward to having people live in the museum someday soon. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge that though each of us is home alone in our house tonight, well perhaps not alone, but in our houses by ourselves together, we are together on Treaty 7 territory. So I want to acknowledge the history and the languages and the traditions and the cultures of the nations on whose traditional land we reside. The Blackfoot Confederacy, which includes Siksika, Tukani, and Ghana, the Sutina, the Sony Dakota First Nations, including the Chiniki, Wesley, and Bears Paw Bands, and of course the Métis Nation Three. Their contributions to Glenbow and their continued support are integral to the museum's success in educating our visitors and sharing the rich heritage of this amazing land. 
Um, so many of you are aware that the exhibition Vivian Meyer in her own hands opened at Glembo in February and it was curated by Anne Morin and uh, organized by De Croma out of Spain actually. The exhibition comes from a collection over a, a, over a hundred thousand negatives as well as photographs and personal documents that a man named John Maloof discovered at an auction in Chicago in 2007. And his collection is one of the main sources in the world of Vivian Meyer's photography. And he was the one behind the documentary that rocketed Vivian Meyer to fame when, it was, when that film was nominated for an Oscar in 2015. George is with us tonight. George Weber has been photographing the people and architecture of Calgary and the Canadian West for over 40 years. Born in the Drumheller area, George studied political science and journalism at university and is largely self-taught as an artist. He began taking photographs in the mid-1970s and has been a professional photographer since 1980. Um, George has published several books of photography, all dealing with Alberta subjects, um, such as the Little Bow Hutterite Colony, various First Nation groups, Prairie Architecture, and Calgary's East Village. And I'll include a list of George's books uh, with a bunch of links and other resources uh, when we post this video on Glumbo's blog. Um, so you can access, you can find out more information and dive a little deeper if you wish. So in 1999, George was inducted into the Royal Canadian Academy of Arts in recognition of his contributions to the visual arts in Canada. He has twice been the recipient of the National Magazine Gold Award for photojournalism. And in 2019, he received the Doug and Lois Mitchell Outstanding Calgary Artist Award. Um, his work is included in many museum collections in Europe and Canada, and uh, the most significant collection of his work resides at Glenbow. Uh, so I wanted to just end with one little quote, actually two quotes, I found as I was looking through your files, George, in terms of everything that's come to Glenbow from your body of work. There were two quotes that stood out for me from the curators who had written the explanations of why you are an important artist. <laughs> Thank you, Jenny. Um, so, and one of the first one was, in addition to demonstrating how contemporary artists can reimagine traditional subjects and genres, George Weber's images are of value in the study of the arts for their contributions to placemaking. I thought that was a really interesting way of framing the fact that you really represent Alberta in, in such a unique way. And, and that's the power of your photography is really that place making. The other one is not content to simply capture an image and leave the scene. George Weber spends time and develops relationships with his subjects. And I just thought that was nice too, because that's so much a part of, you see that in the photographs of your people. Um, and I realized that I forgot to show all your photographs while I was talking about you. <laughs> so let me, well, run through that and um, sure. tell me, and maybe you can start off with your um, your introduction to Vivian Meyer 101 as we look at your photographs. Tell us what you have learned in your research about Vivian Meyer. Sure. Well, uh, yeah, just very briefly for context, these are primarily uh, street photographs that I did in uh, Calgary uh, between about 1975 and 1995. Um, Vivian is a, you know, a really interesting uh, photographer and artist. Um, uh, when we talked about Vivian Meyer 101, uh, it's interesting, she was born of a French mother, Austrian father, and she spent much of her childhood, uh, as well as her young adult life, uh, traveling back and forth between uh, New York City and France. And uh, her family life and relationships were not strong. They were not good. You're just cutting into a little section of uh, work here uh, on the Hutterites. Uh, you mentioned the relationship and they're, they're certainly an important one for me. Um, Meyer led a pretty solitary life. Um, you know, as far as, as far as we know, there was no, um, you know, significant relationship in her life. Um, and, uh, some people have said that, uh, some critics have noted that because she spent a lot of her, uh, her young years in France, that she brings a bit of an outsider's perspective. So even though she's American born, grew up in New York, she brings a bit of an outsider's uh, eye uh, and a bit of a critical sharp eye in a way that someone who lived in an environment the way I have for so many years uh, perhaps might not do. And, um, you know, I think we'd also talked about the fact that 
you know, Meyer came to my attention and to many people's attention. Uh, there were magazine articles, newspaper pieces written about her. There was also the, uh, the Academy Award nominated film that you mentioned. And, you know, I feel I'm a special uh, bit of a kindred spirit. I think uh, Vivian and I basically share uh, a single dominant and important influence in both of our careers. Uh, Meyer in uh, 1952 saw an exhibition of photography at the Museum of Modern Art, an exhibition called Five French Photographers. One of the photographers in that exhibition was the great French street photographer Cartier-Bresson. Uh, that I believe got Meyer's uh, career started. I, um, many years later in Calgary, was doing some research for a film script I was working on. I saw a book of Cartier-Bresson's photographs. Um, it was about 44 years ago, and it was um, pivotal in my life. It, 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 it animated my career, I think, in the same way that it did Myers. That's such an interesting and, and amazing connection through the timeline and through the eras. Um, one thing to note again for people who are watching that will this recording, um, this is being recorded, and we're going to post it on Glenbow's blog at the end, and I'm going to include links to um, information about Henri Cartier-Bresson and um, to your own books and to Excellent. everything we talk about here so that people can access it later. Uh, and we expect that we're probably going to go for about an hour or so. We're going to keep it loose and, and see where we go with the conversation. Sounds good, Jenny. Um, so street photography. Uh, Vivian Meyer is most recognized for her street photography, I think. And um, Can you tell us a little bit about what it is as a photographer photographic genre and and why it's compelling well you know street photography is interesting um, we did mention Cartier-Bresson and he stands as kind of an iconic figure uh, for several reasons because his work really personifies what defines street photography it's often about finding sort of improbable or chance or often almost sort of surreal uh, encounters in the street uh, it places a premium on the, <clears throat> pardon me, the photographer's ability to size things up quickly, uh, to be able to move quickly toward a subject, to be unobtrusive. And when it's really being done well, a uh, photographer not only harvests a moment, but uh, the, the graphic or composition, compositional elements in the photograph strengthen the dramatic impact of the photograph. Uh, when it's exceptionally well done, there's also uh, an emotional element that the photographer draws from the scene. It could be something joyful, sexy, romantic, poignant, whatever it might be. Um, there's a tradition that Meyer and myself and many other street photographers, including Cartier Brasson, typically adhere to is that they typically use lenses on their cameras that are very close to reproducing the world the way that the human eye sees the world. So that's typically thought to be around a 50 millimeter lens. So the idea is that it's, it's intuition, observation, like as in this case, you know, capturing the graphic potential of the scene in both this photograph and the one that follows uh, in a way which produces something which is very satisfying aesthetically, as well as narratively, as well as emotionally, um, street photography uh, is a type of photography that often requires uh, vigilance, time, patience, courage, tenacity, and uh, heavy editing because usually uh, even a gifted photographer like Cartier-Bresson or Meyer will shoot many, many images to be able to harvest out a few where just like everything all comes together perfectly. So in that sense, they're not unlike uh, Olympic athletes prepping for competition. It's just that everything at a particular moment in a particular place comes together when it's being done really well. Can you talk a little bit about how street photography is different from photojournalism or, or is it? Well, it is, you know, uh, as I was saying, uh, street photography really has a lot to do with chance uh, luck, timing, intuition, and it really doesn't have much of an agenda. If you think of photojournalism, uh, photojournalism classically is a, is a genre which has to do with um, capturing uh, a, a story or an event. Um, it could be a sporting event, a political event, or something of that sort. 
So it's, it's, its role is really to transcribe and to pull from reality, something that uh, communicates clearly. You know, we live in a city where there are some great photojournalists. There's people like Leah Hennel, uh, Todd Coral, and the venerable, and I hope he's watching, uh, Mike Drew. People who have made a career of basically extracting the little stories and then conveying those uh, often through a newspaper, uh, uh, traditionally, or more often now today through the, uh, through the web, which is, you know, telling us about the events in our lives. And then you haven't asked me, but the, the third ally genre, of course, is documentary work, which is typically involved in more in-depth, lengthy uh, encounters with subjects or stories. And that's, that's really my place as a photographer, I think. Well, maybe talk a little bit about that um, in terms of documentary photographer. What photography, what is it that attracts you in particular to that format? Well, there's, you know, there's a number of things. Um, I'm, I love to photograph and I love to enter into places and I'm deeply attracted to places where you're not really supposed to go, essentially, right? And some people say I stick my nose into places where I shouldn't. Um, Charlene Dobemeyer, who published several of my books, said, George, you're just so earnest with people that they just can't kind of turn you away. And, you know, so things like the Hutterites, uh, are things, that's the, <laughs> an appropriate uh, descriptor. But people like the Hutterites, uh, very difficult to gain access to those communities. Um, so there's a lengthy sort of an undertaking there. There's, there's a similar thing that happens uh, to gain access to photograph on First Nations communities. A similar thing, you know, when you're photographing places where the sex and the drug trade is, is active, you know, in inner city hotels and that sort of thing. So the, the, the challenge of winning people's trust um, and entering in and then telling their stories, hopefully uh, richly in, in the photographs is something that I'm very, very attracted to. And there's something enormously gratifying and exciting about somebody looking at you after you've asked them and them saying, yes, you can come in here for a while, right? And, um, you know, it's also led in, uh, to some really wonderful relationships uh, for me. And uh, the idea of returning to a place over and over and over again, uh, burrowing down, uh, is something that... Um, it works really well for me as a photographer, I believe. Um, thank you. That it's so interesting to hear about how, like, what motivates you and and what what moves you as a photographer. Can you talk about a little bit from your perspective? What do you think motivated Vivian Meyer to take photographs, and why is that important to how we see her work? Well, you know. Uh, Again, you know, I'm going to say that there's some things uh, that I, you know, I feel I share with Vivian, especially as I've done some research and gotten to know, know her work better. Um, a powerful initial motive for her, I think, was seeing great photography. You know, the Cartier-Bresson work that both of us looked at. You look at something uh, that really moves you, and I think that's often a real clue to potentially maybe what your own gifts might be. I think if you recognize the greatness in another creative person's work, that's a clue to maybe where your own particular gifts lie. I think in Meyer's case also, uh, because she led a very solitary life, it was a practical thing. It got her out of the house on a regular basis, right? She was a nanny uh, most of, uh, for most of her working career. And um, getting out, uh, you know, getting out of here for a while and getting out into the street is a, is a healthy thing. Uh, Bill Cunningham, who many people will know, who is also a very respected street photographer in New York, who worked primarily, his subject was primarily fashion. He said, you know, if I'm feeling down, if I'm feeling sad at the office, I go into the street and I feel happier. There's something about that interaction with life and the richness and the complexity, the beauty of life, uh, that's, uh, that's good for a person. You know, on a, on a, perhaps a more psychological level, I think it, uh, it gives a person a sense of ownership. Um, you know, you, you could say in a sense that Meyer was a bit rootless, you know. She, she was New York born, but she traveled between New York and, uh, and, and France. Her family life is divisive. She could take her camera though, and she could walk out into the streets of Chicago, which she did for, you know, literally about 40 years. 
and she could claim a piece of the city and she could connect to a piece of the city and she could become a part of the, of, of the city. And, you know, there is something about picture making which uh, encourages uh, a greater depth, a greater seeing uh, than walking around without a camera. And even if you talk, if you were to talk to her or any photographer, a little switch goes on if you've got your camera on your shoulder. There's a, there's a deepening appreciation uh, and a, attention to, to what you're seeing and what you're looking at when you're carrying your camera. Thank you. Um, you're known for your portraits in particular, among many other things, but why do you, you've already spoken a little bit about that, that intimacy and that relationship that you build. What is it that attracts you to taking portraits of people? You know, it's, I mean, I, it's, it is interesting. I've talked about how street photography was an important uh, thing and I, it's something that I still do. Uh, but there is something about uh, portrait photography. Uh, you know, there's a number of things. One of course is that potential to build a relationship. There's the intimacy uh, given, the trust often given to uh, someone like myself when I'm entering into doing really what is more properly termed environmental portraiture. So it's, it's the person, it's the place, and how those two things and the, the environment, if it's well and carefully seen, can also help to tell the story. Um, there is just the, uh, I guess also, the possibility, and if you think about it in a way, photography really is about the surface of things. When you make a photograph, you can't look below the surface in the way that a, a novelist can, for instance. Uh, but when it's good and when the subject is really open to the, to the encounter, I think there is the possibility of just kind of looking a, a tiny bit below the surface to something more authentic, something more spiritual in the person. And of course, there is a, there's, there's a, there's a long tradition in, in Western art, especially Western Christian art, where uh, we learn from, we uh, looking at images of, of Christ, for instance, or, uh, or, or the apostles. And uh, someone like, um, uh, gosh, I've forgotten the name, but uh, uh, someone, I, it was Gandhi. Gandhi once said, you know, if you don't see, uh, if you don't see God in the face of the next person you meet, don't bother to look any farther, right? So there is that, there's that potential uh, to connect, to appreciate, uh, to honor. Um, and there's something about the intimate, uh, thoughtful interaction that happens in a portrait photograph, as opposed to a street photograph, it's powerful. And it's, it's the most challenging alchemy for me in all of photography. Because the great ones are exactly half about the photographer and half about the subject. They both have to be willing to give completely. And the recipe for the great portrait is, is in both entering into that relationship. Mm, thank you. Uh, Vivian certainly um, is known, she's also known for her portraits and some of them are, are so incredible. Um, she was, she tended to take photographs of people on the margins of society. She, uh, perhaps her, 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 her own, the fact that she was a woman and a nanny allowed her to move through circles in a little bit more of an invisible way. Um, but she focused a lot on children, poor people, people of color, people who weren't necessarily represented in mainstream culture very often or, or heard or seen. What do you think drew her to those subjects from your perspective? You know, I think it's, uh, I think that's a really, uh, I think that's a really interesting and in, uh, accurate observation. This is one of my favorite uh, Meyer portraits. Uh, there's a sweetness and dignity and gentle, uh, sort of uh, an openness in this, uh, in this woman's face to Meyer, which I just find ex absolutely exquisite. Um, I think you're right. I mean, there was something I think about Meyer's own life story um, and her own her sense of self that gave her a, a, a particular awareness and sensitivity uh, to women, to children, uh, sometimes to the marginalized. And um, it's interesting uh, that you know, a male photographer can photograph certain things in certain ways. Uh, a, a woman, a female photographer can photograph certain things in certain ways. 
And Meyer um, was just inevitably drawn to, you know, people that had maybe suffered, you know, in, in their lives or in some fashion. And, um, you know, it's, it's interesting too, uh, that uh, the, the, the uh, critic Susan Sontag once wrote, every portrait is a self portrait. And when you refract Meyer's photography through that lens, it's interesting to see how, you know, themes of vulnerability, um, you know, uh, and, and in some cases, as such in this one, sort of counter uh, pointing Meyer's uh, more um, anonymous sort of groomed down sensibility compared to uh, the photograph of this perhaps middle class uh, woman that, that we're looking at in that particular image. Um, but it's, it is interesting and it, I think it's one of the defining things of most photographers' careers is that uh, there are things that they're drawn to. And of course then there's, there's, there's work like this image. It's, uh, it's, it's deliberately comic, uh, it's lighthearted, it's not a self-portrait. It's perhaps a little bit of a parody of vanity or something. And some people said that uh, Meyer had also a sensitivity sometimes to the, the male body in repose. We're not looking at it right in this particular case. Or this lovely little portrait that, you know, from what I've heard and read about Meyer, her sort of feisty, straightforward uh, way of taking on the world, uh, you know, I would say this is, this is Meyer reflected uh, powerfully in this, uh, in this strong, beautiful, confident uh, little girl's face and uh, pose to the camera. I think it's interesting how sometimes you can see that people are aware that their photograph is being taken and sometimes they're not. Um, <laughs> I like this little guy too. Uh, <laughs> um, can you talk about that a little bit in terms of uh, the the job of a photographer, uh, e even now in contemporary, I think it's probably changed over time to be cognizant about privacy and consent and the responsibility, taking responsibility for their subject so that you're not um, infringing on people. Yeah, it's a good question. And, you know, I guess there's, there's a couple of things. Uh, you know, the first thing is that uh, as an activity street uh, and as you know, Meyer did the vast majority of her work in the U.S. and uh, uh, the, the, the basic concept of uh, free speech and freedom of expression is seen as, as, as a defense of, of this kind of work. Uh, in Canada, uh, as part of the um, Personal Information Protection Act and the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, there's also reference made to uh, privacy and the need for photography to be, uh, if it's to be published, it has to be consented to. But there's a very strong exemption in there, which is works which are designed for, uh, I've got it here, art artistic, um, journalistic, or literary purposes are exempt. Because we believe that uh, it is important that uh, photographs are made in the way that journalists would to tell the story of what's happening today, but also as an important uh, historical record. So uh, there's that. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of okay to do street photography and, it, and it's, the, the value of it to the culture is, is, you know, pretty clear. It's important that we are, are able to record and see what goes on around us today. And that a record of that exists for the future. It's interesting in terms of the attitude of the photographer though. Um, you know, there are a number of American photographers, some people will know the names, people like uh, Gary Winogrand or Bruce Gilden, um, who could be said to be kind of feisty and aggressive in the streets when they're, when they're photographing. Uh, it's an approach that I don't uh, personally find uh, attractive, uh, I must say. Um, I think, uh, you know, there's a place for, for common sense, for treating people with respect. Uh, when people don't want to be photographed, not photographing them. Uh, when they want you to delete something, uh, delete it. Uh, um, no photograph is worth damaging your character for. Um, and you know, uh, I mean, that's just good being a good citizen. But on another level, you know, as I mentioned, because a lot of my work does uh, hinge on my capacity to enter into people's lives and to have those people trust me. If you kind of do the right thing, you take the high ground uh, as, your, as your rule when you're, when you're doing photography, 
The next time you're out and you're asking somebody to photograph them or you're actually out working, people intuit that. They pick up that they're dealing with somebody who's respectful and caring uh, for them and they feel safe in that person's presence. Um, so uh, it's, it's a challenging thing and I myself and I think for many others, it, it is, uh, it's, it's, it's a somewhat awkward and unusual thing to be out somewhere and then photographing others. I mean, it seems on some level a strange thing, but I think there's value in the creation of the work, uh, but certainly uh, only and large, well, only when it's done uh, respectfully and thoughtfully. Um, you know, I've had situations where people have consented. Uh, I've done lengthy photographic projects where people have consented for the photography to be used. When I was editing and looking at the work, I thought, you know, this isn't, this isn't going to be a good idea for this work to get out. So it doesn't get out. It, it, it gets it gets chopped essentially. I think it's so interesting because as you talked about um, photography being half, half self-portrait of the photographer, I think Vivian's work is so interesting because sometimes you see such empathy and, and um, a relationship, even if she doesn't know the person, like there, there's definitely a, a sympathy there between her and her subject. Sometimes, as you say, there's a, a almost comic or, or satirical perspective or even a voyeuristic one in her eye as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very interesting that you can almost see her own perspective on the world through who she took that care with and who she, she was able to um, sort of poke fun at or, or maybe even expose as, as you know. Um, I, think, I think that's a really, I think that's a great observation. Yeah, and I would certainly agree with that. Um, let's talk about uh, what it takes to be a professional photographer and um, I'm, going to just take a minute here, um, set myself back up here. Um, Vivian, is most of her very, very famous photographer, photographs are, were taken using a roll effects camera. She had several throughout her, her career. Um, but maybe you could talk about, um, I have a few questions, but I want to talk about the tools of the trade. So the, the em emphasis that a camera can have on uh, the perspective of photographer. Maybe let's talk about that first. Sure. Uh, yeah, well, I just want a little a small shout out here. I hope she's watching. This camera actually belongs to a good friend of mine, Colleen Rosher, who I met in a darkroom class at SAIT, and who earlier this year was selected as Calgary's Outstanding Emerging Photographer. So Colleen, you owe me. Um, anyhow, uh, yeah, this is uh, a Roly that Colleen owns, but it looks a lot like uh, it's, it's, it's essentially the same type of camera that uh, Vivian Meyer worked with. So it's an interesting tool. A um, couple of things. Uh, it's a, it's, this is called a twin lens reflex camera. So you don't look through an eyepiece in the way that you do, do with, a, say, a, a Leica rangefinder or a Canon or Nikon uh, SLR camera. You look down through a waist level viewfinder, and you can actually see it there the way that Meyer is holding it. And so you look down uh, through this uh, top level viewfinder. Which is, which is along you with a 90 degree prism or mirror, pardon me, to see the subject. So you're not looking directly at the subject, you're looking at the subject somewhat obliquely. Some people feel that there's a psychology in that where you're not looking directly at the subject that is disarming in a good way so that the subject is not quite as aware that they're being photographed and doesn't seem quite so uh, intimate and perhaps predatory. Other things interesting about the camera are that it uh, takes 12 frames. So if you think about it, you know, compared to an iPhone where you just, or many of our contemporary uh, digital cameras where you're shooting, many images, you know, here's a contact sheet. So Vivian would load up a, a roll of film, walk around, take 12 pictures, stop, unload the camera, and then put another uh, roll of film in. So uh, unlike the, the promiscuous quality of a lot of contemporary photographers, you have to be very sort of measured not only because of the cost, but because if you came upon something fabulous and you had just shot the 11th or 12th frame, you were gonna be hooped. There was no way you could get the camera ready to keep shooting. Some uh, critics have, have commented also, interestingly, that Meyer, because she was working with a larger negative, the, the negative produced by her camera is about three and a half times as large as a 35 millimeter negative. So there's a lot of fine detail and quality but cameras like this were not 
the, the, the common choice, you know, really from about the 1950s onward, where the more, uh, you know, the quicker, more direct uh, to work with camera that was loaded with 36 exposures really then became the norm. Um, there's also a compositional element, which is interesting in this format. It produces square negatives. And square negatives are interesting, but they're difficult. It's a square capture format is very symmetrical. It's difficult to make compositions that have the energy of a car tube or a sawn photograph, which is done with a rectangular capture format. Um, there have been other great photographers, Diane Arbus would be one that comes to mind, who worked very skillfully with the square format. But it, it has limitations both in terms of uh, the, the, the very symmetrical shape. Um, and as I say, there's limitations in terms of how quickly the camera can be worked with. Um, but for Meyer, it was her camera. And it's interesting, most photographers will find a format, uh, you know, whether it's a medium format camera like this or 35 millimeter or a range finder or an SLR or a mirrorless camera, the newer cameras, that's a good fit for them. And there was something robust and practical about the, uh, the roller that worked well for Meyer. So here's the Leica. Uh, this is really my favorite camera for film photography. It was a camera that uh, Cartier Brisson worked with for much of his career. And it was really the template, uh, the, the rangefinder uh, camera like, such as this Leica, which came to market in the 1920s is really the template of virtually all other photography from that day to, to today, right? If you look at a brand new Sony mirrorless camera, it looks a lot like this particular format. So it, it's been the more enduring and classic um, of the two ways of working. And here's Meyer, interestingly, well-timed there, uh, holding I, what I believe could be a contact, which is another, uh, like a brother camera to the Leica effectively. And here, obviously, she either had somebody push a, a button on a camera that was on a tripod, or perhaps she'd set up a camera on a tripod on a self-timer to take this photograph um, of the, the, this self-portrait, basically. And um, it's interesting that Meyer, uh, her, as her career evolved, uh, and here's another photograph, and this one, I think, uh, it appears to have been taken with a 35 millimeter camera. So we're looking at that uh, more classically rectangular format, but the way she centered the image um, uh, indicates, I guess, that, that lineage of the, uh, the, the centered compositional quality that you see in much of her work that came from the, um, from the use of the square format Roloflex negatives. Cool. Um, this, is, this is a sequence of her color photography because she, um, while she's, we mo mostly are familiar with the black and white work, she did experiment with color and was sort of an early author of color when you think about the time frame that she was working. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, you know, in the research, uh, she, was, she was a fan of two types of film for most of her career. Her black and white film was done with Kodak Tri-X. And most of her color, film, her color work was done with uh, Kodak Ektachrome slide film. Uh, now, uh, the, the, the slide film, in a sense, is an interesting choice because you, know, you take it in, you get it processed, you hold it up to the light, and you get a little mini version of what the photograph's going to look like. But it's also a great way of capturing uh, color images in a way that, uh, in a later generation, because they're very color fast, they could be they could be scanned and they could be um, turned into to really artful uh, color photographs. There's a kind of a looseness. There's also <clears throat> in a lot of Meyer's later work, a lot of her color work, you see a little bit of a movement away from photographing people, and a little bit more interest in photographing things, and um, or uh, or or in this case, you know, a, a person, but a, but but a portion in a sense. And um, she seemed to uh, just slightly uh, move away from, uh, you know, the people to a large extent, to references to people, self-portraiture, a lot of photography of photographs, which is a kind of an interesting sort of a modernist sort of a thing, where you think of a lot of the interesting things happening in contemporary photography, which really have to do with uh, 
artists or photographers repurposing other work or work by other photographers. This work also reminds me of um, a lot of the work of one of my favorite living photographers, William Eggleston. And some critics have mentioned that if you look at Meyer's body of work, you'll see some William Eggleston, some Diane Arbus, some Robert Frank. She seemed to just kind of uh, skid up close to many of the greatest photographers um, of the 20th century. She maybe didn't dig as deeply as some of these other photographers, but she, her, her capacity to kind of skip by and take influences uh, and inspiration from these others was a really interesting thing. And as you know, she was a voracious collector of photography monographs and books. So she, uh, as you mentioned earlier, Jenny, was largely self-taught, but she was very knowledgeable and conversant with what was going on in the world of photography when she was doing her own work. She was not a, an uninformed primitive, for sure. Um, that actually is a great segue to another question that I have. Um, one of the noteworthy things about Vivian Meyer is that she rarely developed her own film. Early on in her life, she did have access to a dark room in, the, in her own quarters in the house uh, of a family who she was nannying for. But after she left that family, she no longer had access to a, a dark room to develop her film herself. And there are sporadic sort of evidence of her going to um, have her film developed commercially. But uh, after that, she just didn't do as much due to cost or, or maybe she was just so particular. But can you talk about that idea of um, the editing process and the development process of, of being a photographer and, and why it's such an enormous part of, of most professional photographers' careers and, and practices? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. And, you know, it's interesting, uh, you sort of alluded to it here, but uh, it's thought that at the time of Meyer's death, approximately one third of the many, many photographs she took had, ne had never been processed. So she hadn't seen them, nobody else had seen them. So in a way, uh, you know, photography is about looking, but a huge part of it is about looking at the photographs that you've done. It's a very two-way process, looking into the world and then seeing uh, what's come back out of the world for you. Um, photography, as we talked about earlier, is a very promiscuous medium, uh, even then, but nowadays especially, people take many, many photographs if they're doing photography. And um, there's one interesting uh, case I'll just mention. Many people will have heard of Robert Frank and his very famous book, The Americans, which was uh, published in the late 1950s. It's held up as one of the most important books in the history of photography. Uh, Frank, who was uh, Swiss born, traveled across the States in the mid fifties, uh, took about 27,000 photographs and he published the book, The Americans, which contains 83 out of 27,000. Now, there would have been a lot more than 83 really good photographs, but the, some people believe, and I guess I'm one of them, that uh, significant photography careers and uh, projects uh, of course, they're about the photography, but the editing is arguably almost as important. Good editing is typically about two things. It's about knowing where the good stuff is. And then it's knowing about how to weave all of the, all of the bits together. And, you know, we, we recognize the Robert Frank book as a masterwork, uh, not only for his photography, but for his editing as well. And in Meyer's case, uh, of course, she didn't show any of her work. She didn't even see a very significant portion of the work that she'd done herself. And so a lot of the projects that have been done uh, based on her work by people like uh, John Maloof and Howard Greenberg, her gallerist in New York, have taken the uh, position, I believe, of trying to introduce Meyer's work uh, in, in a bit, in a sense, in a survey fashion, where you, they wanted to bring it to an audience give people a sense of the breadth and scope of our work and then show it that way. And I think there have been some very fine books. I think the greatest Meyer book is still waiting to be published because when we look at Cartier Brisson or Robert Frank, we're not looking at everything they've done. We're looking at their very best and most signature work. And uh, some uh, critics have said, you know, one of the definitions of the truly great photographers is, is that they keep taking the same photograph over and over and over again. You know, if you think of Cartier-Bresson or Ansel Adams, there's, there's these iconic images. 
and they seem to kind of riff or work off of these 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 iconic pieces. And I I think there's a as I said I think there's a place. I mean, the exhibition that's on at Glenbow right now has some very very fine work. Um, you know, if I was curating, I might maybe take a little bit of the formalist work out and maybe include a little bit more of the street work. The exhibition is an, ex, an, an astonishingly good survey exhibition, um, but I would respectfully challenge and say it might not be Meyer's very, very best work. And that's maybe not the intent of the exhibition. It was really to, to produce a very interesting, compelling survey work that still carries uh, and contains much of her most significant and, uh, and important work, I would say. Uh, you're so good at segueing into the exact question I want to ask you. <laughs> because We're good together, Jenny. We're good together. <laughs> um, because I think you put it on the head. I think Vivian, um, Vivian's story has been reconstructed by other people, and she never got the chance to select her own best work, let alone give permission for people to see it. Um, and uh, I'm going to segue now to her, her portrait, her self-portrait, mm -hmm. because I think those are really her making her own mark on, on our world, certainly, even though she didn't necessarily intend to. Um, but could you talk a little bit about, I mean, her, the ownership and control of her photography has been controversial and mired in court cases uh, for years. Are we, is it right to have this much access to someone's creative output without their explicit permission? Yeah, you know, that's such a good question. And it's such a, it's such a difficult one to answer. I don't want to be glib, but she probably doesn't care too much at this point in a way. And I think if she did go down to the Glenbow and, and saw the, the, the beautifully uh, curated installation and the beautifully crafted prints that have been made by master darkroom craftsmen of her work, I think she'd be kind of delighted, you know, I mean, there's, there's no way to know. Uh, but, but you're right, it's, um, uh, it is troubling. And Howard Greenberg, her, uh, her, her primary dealer, has commented on that fact. He said that um, there's something inherently questionable and inherently wrong about presenting the work uh, of someone else. It's, not, it's, it's someone else's interpretation. He also went on to say, though, that when Meyer's story surfaced and when the work surfaced, people just came in droves. There's something so you know, compelling about her life story her anonymity. And I think one thing that I, one of the reasons I think she's so attractive to, to us is, is because she's withheld so much, right? Uh, she's sort of the opposite uh, of many uh, people who work in photography today who have a strong uh, desire, a, a legitimate one to, to share the work. Her impulse was to hold it close. And in doing that, um, it afforded her an enormous freedom. Uh, the, the opinions of other people, uh, the praise or criticism of, of others, she was, she was immune to that. So she was able to respond to her own uh, promptings, her own intuition. And you know, there's lots of choices that creative people can make in life. Uh, and one of the biggest ones is if you wanna choose freedom. And freedom uh, is, a great thing, but there's a big price to be paid for it. And uh, I think Meyer uh, really exemplifies that. And of course, uh, the other thing that is, is interesting, and again, arguably this is maybe, maybe her most important work, is because there's this idea of this riffing thing. I mean, she photographed, like how many ways are there to take a photograph of yourself, Jenny? Well, lots as it turns out, right? And there's photographers like Lee Friedlander, a, a great contemporary, master still uh, working in, uh, in in the eastern United States and all over for that matter who has spent uh, I'm gonna say I think around 50 years doing self-portraits and every time you think you've seen every conceivable way that somebody can uh, interact with themselves and the camera Friedlander comes up with something interesting and, and that's a deeply inspiring thing how uh, a person can be so animated and, and find such richness in those two little things, their face and a camera, and then with the world to fill in all the, all the other bits to make that interaction uh, never ending in its charm for them. Um, that is, leads me to the, the last final sort of formal question, um, aside from your, your secret reveal at the end. Um, 
once we finish with George, uh, once I let him go free, we're gonna we have lots of good questions coming in and I will ask you questions from the audience. But okay. first, um, as a final sort of uh, Vivian note, um, mm -hmm. in terms of the, the formal um, examination of her work, uh, what can, what do you think people can, what's interesting and inspiring about her career and what can people learn about her as a photographer, especially photographers, what can they learn from Vivian? Um, in seeing her photographs and, and in understanding how she worked? Well, you know, one thing that I, I find really compelling is her, um, is how she followed her own intuition. Um, she didn't seek uh, the opinions of others. She, she, she kept the work really close uh, because creative work um, is a kind of a fragile thing, right? And uh, so, if, there's only three things that can happen when you let a photograph out into the world. Either people don't care at all. That's the common thing. Uh, sometimes people criticize it and that can sort of make you doubt your instincts and your way of working. Or even more dangerously, they can praise it. That might be the most prickly one of the bunch because it, it, it sets up a, a desire and an expectation to have your work valued or liked. And then if that, uh, so, so, so it's a call to do to work really not primarily for yourself, but for your audience. Now, just to be clear, I've had kind of a Jekyll and Hyde career, right? I did my teaching, my assignment work. I, I love being a photographer as a craftsman, but there was also the part where I would go out and I would photograph and in some cases work for years and years and not even anybody in my family would know what I was up to sort of thing, right? And uh, I did that because I felt that if I shared the work, I would be uh, influenced by the opinions of others. And I think that uh, there, there is something to be said for, by all means, share your photography if, you, if that's empowering to you, but consider holding a little bit of it back just for yourself. Um, and it, it will sometimes uh, be useful and instructive to you in terms of your career uh, to not hear uh, and be influenced by the opinions of others at, at sort of critical junctures. My sisters used to ask me, and they say, like, what are you doing going out there wandering around? My sister Pat in Toronto lived with me for a number of years. She's like, what are you doing going out and doing this stuff, right? Now, luckily I didn't pay much attention to her, right? And I kept doing it. Uh, but it's, um, I think that's an important thing uh, to, you know, to honor your own intuition, especially when you're doing personal work. And, um, I think uh, enjoy it and find, find in photography, photography is a gift obviously. And as with all gifts, uh, you can use them well or, or poorly. And I think Meyer used photography as a way of connecting to the, the world, getting out of there for a while and, and being, being able to put the kids behind for a while, right? Sort of thing with all that nanny work. So it was a, it was a, it was a good thing for her. It was a healthy thing for her. It was an empowering thing for her. And because she chose freedom, uh, she produced uh, work which uh, has really enriched uh, and inspired a, another generation of artists and photographers. Thank you. And now we have a very special uh, tour de force, George, um, I don't know, world premiere <laughs> of your discovery. Yeah, don't build this up too high, girl. You're getting me in trouble. <laughs> That's kind of cool. Um, <laughs> One of the things that, that was an interesting part of the exhibition at Glumbo is that there was one photograph that the curator told us. We knew that, that Vivian had traveled the world. She, um, she loved travel and she loved learning about the world. And she did come to Canada. And there was a photograph that was apparently taken in Calgary in our exhibition. And that was this one, <laughs> which is kind of a funny photograph. Um, and as you say, one of more, her more formalist, uh, it's not the, mo the most emotive of images, but it's sort of an interesting side note that this one was supposedly taken to Calgary. But through your research, you actually found another Vivian photograph that I'm not sure actually anyone has officially recognized as being taken in Calgary. Yeah, well, thanks, Jenny. And yeah, it was just an interesting little fortuitous, blessed little set of circumstances. So I, I picked up a book as part of the research, a book called um, A Photographer's Life and Afterlife by um, 
uh, a Northwestern University uh, academic, um, Pamela Banos. And I, I think it's a terrific book. It was probably the richest uh, source of um, my research for this uh, project. So I was flipping through the book, flipping through the book, and I see this little throwaway sentence. Vivian traveled from Chicago to Quebec City and then traveled west across Canada, ending her trip in Los Angeles, Los Angeles in 1955. And I'm sitting there thinking, whoa. Okay, now she got on in Quebec City and she ended up in Los Angeles. Probably she went through Calgary, right? So I'm thinking about this and thinking about being able to share this when I do my little presentation at the Glenville. And I mentioned it uh, one night uh, at SAIT in the darkroom class that I was teaching. After the class, one of the students came up to me, a gentleman named Paul, and he said, uh, you know, my wife has had an ongoing interest in Vivian Meyer. And in about, about 2011, she was going through blogs and looking at work and the like. And she found a photograph uh, that was uncaptioned. Uh, there was nothing in Meyer's notes or anything else that indicated where the photograph was taken. But that photograph has to have been taken in Calgary. And uh, I said, well, like, how do you know that? And how can we prove that? So he, the, the photograph was sent to me. We looked at it. Uh, and the photograph, which I think you're just about ready to, your, your finger is itching, you're going to bring it up, which was taken on the corner of 7th Avenue and 1st Street Southwest. Oh, you went back one. There it is. It's incredible photograph, uh, which was taken by Vivian Meyer, I believe, in 1955. And you, you can, of course, see it identifiably as Calgary. You can see the, the Hudson's Bay building on the right side. You'll notice the uh, grain exchange building just behind that. And uh, Jenny in her possession right now has uh, a link to a John Maloof blog. And if you go down through that, if you scroll down through the blog and you get to image number 27, you will see that it is this image that we have up on the screen right now. Now, we were supposed to talk about this before, but she, she's kept me in suspense. I'm not sure if she's going to mention that or tweet that out or put it on the on the Glenville's uh, website but you can verify uh, firstly the identity of the photographer because of its inclusion in John Maloof's blog about Meyer and you can verify the location because you are from Calgary. <laughs> yeah I should have got a, a, a today shot of that of that corner that would have been cool but I didn't get a chance to get down there. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing there'll be a few people out after seeing this. Chat. Yeah, I was there comparing. Um, that could be the challenge. Create, recreate this image in your own style. So, um, so George, I do have some questions from the audience. Um, I don't necessarily have time for all of them, but uh, there are some great ones that people submitted. And thank you, everyone, for submitting questions and, and hanging out with us for all this time. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, George. I love hanging out and chatting with you about photography. I could do it all day. Thanks, Jenny. Um, so from, I think we've addressed a little bit about what Simone was asking, but there is a question from Simone. Uh, when people go through your photos after you're gone, how many documentary series are they going to find that you have been working on for years, unbeknownst to anyone? That's a great question. Well, you know, at, at this point, you know, I got it, you know, in the interest of honesty, a lot of stuff has migrated up out of the basement over to the Glenmore or into books and that sort of thing. Um, so I don't think there's going to be any gigantic surprises because a lot of, uh, you know, people have seen my work on the Hutterites, the, the Blood First Nation, uh, Calgary, Inner City Calgary, uh, the Badlands, uh, Small Town Alberta and Saskatchewan and that sort of thing. Uh, so there's nothing, well, I shouldn't quite say that. There's a couple of, there's a couple of projects that nobody knows about at this point, but most of it is really uh, a, sort of a continuation or sort of a deeper connection with some projects that I've uh, already created. Having said that, um, you know, I did a, a book on the Hutterites uh, that has about 80 photographs in it. And I have got literally thousands and thousands of negatives and, and, and many, many prints. So uh, you're gonna probably see the, uh, the director's cut kind of a lot of stuff that people have not yet seen. But uh, thanks for that question. Um, I have a bit of an irreverent question from Bill. If Vivian were 
student in your photography class, what overall mark would you give her for your work, for her work, encompassing the, her understanding of the medium, her composition, um, her connection with her subjects, and uh, the messages that she conveyed in her work? Well, of course, I, you know, I, we don't, we don't do a lot of sort of ABC grading at say, you know, in the evening classes, but of course, uh, I, I think very highly of it, and, and especially because of uh, uh, the, the, the individual style, the integrity of the work, you know, and the, the obvious passion that she has. I mean, you know, that for me is, that's the thing that really excites me about photographers uh, more than say, you know, a particular exceptional technical skill, but I, uh, yeah, I'd, uh, I think very, very highly of her work and what she's done. And I'd be yeah, as high a mark as I could give. I, I probably tend to go with. <clears throat> Gary got in touch and asked, um, he said, my feeling is that Vivian did not overcomplicate things with her thought process when out taking pictures. Do you feel this spontaneity contributed to the impact of her photos and her ability to convey emotion and naturally documented moments in time? Yeah, I mean, she was, it's an interesting observation, and I would agree. I think she, took, she had a really sort of intuitive approach to the way that she photographed, you know, what she photographed, how she photographed. I don't think there was a lot of sort of calculation or agenda seeking in her work. Uh, she was responding to the promptings of her, um, of her own imagination. And also, I think it's interesting when you look at photographs, if you're really, really uh, insightful when you look at her work, you can tell what kind of a mood she was in. Was her energy up that day? Was it down a bit? Was she feeling a little bit withdrawn? Was she feeling sort of bold when she was doing that photography? So she really wears her heart on her sleeve and that intuitive open response to the work is I think what gives it, it gives it its freshness and also in some cases its poignancy. When you start to see her sort of disconnecting from people and you know, photographing gutters and, and you know, look, her, her, her glance going down in the latter part of her career. Jenny, a small thing, when you're asking the question, if you're turned a little more directly toward me, I can hear it a bit better. Oh. When you're turned away, I muffles a bit. I'm like trying and, to read and talk. <laughs> yeah, talk out of the side of your mouth kind of thing, right? <laughs> okay, uh, a couple more questions. How do you feel the work of street photographers has changed with our current dependency on mobile technologies? Well, you know, I think it's, uh, it's, I think it's easier. And, uh, you know, one of the things about street photography is if you take lots and lots of photographs and you're working really hard, it's, it's, it's a numbers game. You'll get more good pictures, right? And I recently saw a book of uh, street photography at the camera store, which is, uh, has a superb collection of uh, photography uh, books uh, of contemporary street photography. And one of the bodies of work that was included in the book was by a photographer who was all of his work was done with a, with an iPhone. So uh, the ease and the, the, the frequency, coupled with a knowledge of, of the traditions and history of street photography, uh, promised to unleash a real tidal wave of, of energy and creativity. And your point earlier, Jenny, about how does the tool impact the images? Uh, you know, just imagine photographing with a Rolly or photographing with an iPhone. Where can you get away with more? Where can you shoot more? Where can you shoot more quickly? Where can you shoot more intuitively? So we've got a tool. So somewhere out there in Calgary or Los Angeles today, there's somebody whose work we're going to be looking at and saying this young woman or young man was the great master of their era. And my intuition is that there's a good chance that's going to be done with an iPhone. Interesting. Uh, another question. Would you consider Vivian an outsider? And do you consider yourself an outsider with respect to your work and being a photographer? Well, Vivian, for sure, you know, because she, she deliberately chose the path of uh, um, doing her own work and, and sort of withholding it. Now, if you think, if you mean by an outsider, uh, you know, connecting with a creative community, again, I think she would, you know, she would be in that category. Um, you know, I've been so blessed and so fortunate, and I, and I think, you know, I'm going to say there's, there's been probably two great gifts in my life uh, in terms of what's happened with my work. The Glenville, right up, number one. There's no doubt about it, right? You know, the support and encouragement that I receive from the Glenville just means the world to me. And uh, the publisher of many of my books, RMB, you know, so uh, those things make me 
kind of an insider, right? And to the extent that I've been embraced by some very important um, uh, supporters that have really allowed my work to be, uh, you know, brought to an audience uh, when the time is appropriate for that. And um, so that's a gift, that's a blessing. And uh, uh, so even though Vivian and I do share some similarities, I mean, it's certainly been true that uh, I've been sort of brought uh, inside uh, and supported by publishers and certainly museums and the Glenbow would be the most important uh, uh, supporter in my career for sure. Uh, thank you. For, that's so wonderful to hear about that. I mean, that's, that's what places like Glenbow are for, is to, to be there for the community. Um, I have a related question. Uh, George, you have been inspiring individuals way before 2007. When, when is the next time you'll be able to enjoy a display of your own work? So I'm just going to get you just patch the last part of that question again, Jen. When can we see an exhibition of your work coming up? Um, you know, I'm just trying to think. I don't know if there's anything right on the horizon. There, there were a few exhibitions recently. There was one that was part of a Contemporary Calgary. Um, there was one that was part of a, the Alberta Society of Artists exhibition. Um, you, know, I, you know, quite honestly, at this point in time, I've got a couple of uh, interesting uh, publication opportunities on the near horizon, but um, no, uh, no exhibitions, you know, that are currently scheduled, no sort of major ones at this point, but uh, what do you think, Jenny? Has you got any room down there at the Glenville for me? I'll turn I'm, I'm, what, what a spot to well as an interviewer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's interesting, but you know, it's an interesting question because like uh, what I typically do is I, I shoot, I develop, I print, I put the stuff in a box, I put it in the shelf in the basement and then something happens like, you know, Jenny reaches out to me or a publisher or some exhibition opportunity comes up. So I never actually work for a book or work for an exhibition. I work for the work and work to do it because it's so joyful and so important to me. And then, you know, often some little opportunity comes along. And I think that there might be a lesson in that for photographers which is, well, you know, do the work. And if you do it well and lovingly and uh, little opportunities will come up. And if you're, if you have something and you're, you're available to bring something uh, to an opportunity, um, that that's then that that's great. Uh, that actually almost answers the next question, the final question. Uh, the last one, the last last one is for me. Um, the final question is: uh, I'm curious about the use of the word career in respect to someone who never showed her work or made any income from her work. Yeah, that that that's a good point. Um, you know, I, I think it might be more true to s s speak of Meyer as having a, a vocation or a calling rather than a career. Um, I, I, I would agree with that. Um, you know, we often uh, think of, in our culture, a career as being attached to something that um, uh, is associated with, you know, making a living or an income or something like that, and, which is a valid thing. But uh, Meyer, you know, responded to the higher calling of, of it being a vocation or something that was really essential to her identity. And uh, I, I, you're absolutely right about that. It's uh, calling what she had a career is like saying uh, Stradivarius made violins, right? It's, <laughs> it's true, but uh, you know, not really, not quite. And George, thank you so much for talking to us about photography and Vivian Meyer and your own practice. And um, I just feel like I, I have learned a lot tonight myself, so thank you. Thanks, it was just a lot of fun, Jen, and I really appreciate this opportunity, so thanks okay. again. And if anybody has further questions, by all means, email them or um, uh, try us on social media channels. We're, we're always paying attention on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. We love uh, interacting and having conversations with people there too, so people are welcome to connect with us on any of those platforms while we can't physically do it in person at the museum. So thank you. And with that, I will say good night. Thanks, Jenny. Good night. Bye, George. <laughs>